Let's open our Bibles to the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 19. We're going to be looking today at verses 11, verse 11 to the conclusion, verse 21, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John mentioned several things, a couple of things I'd like to repeat. Uh, we do have our men's conference, fellas, coming up in June, and we look forward to having that. We're still working on a couple of the elements of it, but it's in the middle. It's actually on, the, I think, the 12th of June, so we're looking forward to, to having that. We invite you to be part of that. And also, we do have, like, a Monday night with the young adults. We do have a Tuesday morning men's study. We have our Wednesday uh, we are looking at the book of Job, and I invite you to be with us on Wednesday also. And as mentioned, we do have hopes and plans, and it does look like it's going to be able to take place to go to Israel. And um, we have, uh, John had mentioned, I think we have 195 people who have signed up with the desire to go. That, that doesn't mean that they're going to go. They just would like to go. Uh, but we usually see about uh, a quarter or more of those who signed up they actually do go. So we're looking forward to it very much. And um, if you've never been to Israel and, and all, I, I would highly recommend that you go. And I know it's a, a big expense, but it's well worth it. And uh, I'd love to have you with us as we go, God willing, this upcoming next year. We're looking at the end of March and the first week or so of, uh, of April. That's what we're looking at. But we'll be able, I hope, this week to firm those things up in the other information. So you might want to stay in contact with us. And I, I do hope, again, I do hope you'll, you'll be able to go with us. Now, we're going, we're going to be in Revelation 19. We're looking at a very incredible subject. I mean, something I've been looking forward to, not just because I'm studying the book of Revelation, but because all believers are to, to be looking forward to being with Christ or to see the return of the Lord. And uh, as I've been telling you, Revelation is not is not a, a book that's filled with, uh, with easy-to-digest teachings. I mean, sometimes we may come to church and we may say to ourselves, I don't understand that, I don't get that, that doesn't make sense to me, and uh, that's understandable. So this is one of those uh, studies that is, I, I'm, I'm going to do a lot of looking at my notes again because I want to give to you as proper information as I can. And again, we have some who are I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, and, and this is information you've heard before, and, and it'll help you. And others who perhaps have never even heard this, it may be new information to you, and it may, it may kind of overwhelm you in some ways, uh, but you know what? Just listen to it and, and digest what you can, and, and, uh, and we'll move on. You'll grow, up, uh, grow more up in your, your faith, and, and the Lord will give you more and more uh, insight over, over time. So don't get dis, discouraged, you know. It's, it, is, uh, it is a subject that is uh, a pretty heady subject, you know. When I first got saved, you know, that, uh, that was something I was taught. I, I didn't realize, uh, I didn't hear, I'd never heard anything of the rapture, didn't know anything of the second coming. And so much of what I heard was brand new information, and, and um, it was hard, you know, for me to, to get it. But it's taken years, and I can tell you now, after 50 years, I still don't get it, but it's fun to try. And so... Hopefully, we'll have a good time together. That song that we just sang, you know, uh, that song came out of the Jesus movement. And I had uh, talked to Jared, uh, our worship leader, and I said, I think that's an appropriate song because what we had when we first got saved, uh, those of us who came out, out of that movement, was the, was the expectation of being with Jesus Christ, uh, to see him face to face. And, and so the idea that one day I'd see him actually has propelled me through 50 years of walking with the Lord. And so sometimes people think, well, how, how do you remain faithful to the Lord? You just every day look forward to seeing him, every day. And so we get a chance to look at what has been called the return of Jesus Christ or the second coming. And so we'll begin reading here in chapter 19 at verse 11. I'll read verses 11 through 16, give you a prolonged introduction as I normally do, and then move into the passage. Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 16. John writes, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name 
written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let me begin by pointing out the obvious. As we look around the world, we see that there is a hunger amongst the people of the world, a hunger for peace. It's not even necessarily a hunger for world peace so much as a hunger for personal peace. You see, many refuse to listen to what God's Word says about peace, and they reject what He says completely. They don't realize that being at peace in the world begins really at being uh, at peace with God. When you look at the word gospel and you think of the message of the gospel, one of the things that might help you when you hear of this good news, gospel means good news, when you hear the word gospel or the message of the gospel, something that might help us is, is to understand that the gospel in Scripture is spoken of in this way. It is spoken of as a message of reconciliation. The gospel is God's message of reconciliation. Reconciliation speaks of two people at war, two warring parties that, that come together with terms of peace. And as the terms of peace are accepted, hostility is, is ended. The gospel is God's terms of peace. And in this gospel, you might find this interesting, perhaps you already know this, but in the gospel, God's terms of peace are unconditional surrender. The gospel doesn't call for us to have kind of like an armistice or a treaty. Uh, no, it is an, un, an unconditional surrender. And so those terms of peace are presented to us in what is called the gospel. And when we surrendered to his terms of peace, we came to peace. And now we're at peace with God. Those of us who are believers, now we're at peace with God. And because we're at peace with him, we can live at peace with those around us. Now that came through faith because we have taken him by his, his word and, and we've sought his forgiveness and, and we've once again been in fellowship with him. In Romans 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when the gospel is preached and people are invited to come to Christ, well, there are people who listen, they respond, and they say yes, but there are many who refuse. That message, those terms of peace, well, that's ignored. As a matter of fact, the thought of turning from sin for many people is actually offensive. Now, that reminds me of something that, that we read in the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament in chapter 6. You see, Jeremiah, a prophet, pro proclaimed that, that God was bringing judgment, but the people he was speaking to refused to listen to what he had to say. So Jeremiah responded to their rejection in chapter 6, verse 10. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so that they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. No one's going to take the time to listen is what he's saying much less respond to what is being said. You see, God's command for them to repent offends them. They feel wronged by it. They find no pleasure in it because it inflames them as if they've been personally injured. When somebody hears the word of conviction, sometimes they take it out on the messenger as if the messenger made up that message. But all we are as, as preachers of the gospel are just proclaimers of what God has said. We didn't invent the message. What we did is we simply have been called to be faithful in presenting it. But not everybody likes to hear that. Proverbs 15, 12 says it like this. Mockers resent correction, so they avoid the wise. We don't want to hear it. Don't tell us about it. Well, what was true then remains true until Jesus returns to planet Earth. People are longing for peace, and false prophets, false teachers have lied to them. They're crying out peace when there is no peace. God had given warnings for people to avoid false prophets, but from the beginning, they've refused to listen to the warnings. We've seen in the book of, in the book of uh, Revelation that during the tribulation, many listen to what the false prophet is saying. 
And this came even though they had been warned about it many times. Jesus had warned them. He said, avoid the prophets that are to come. In Matthew 24, 24, and 25, he said, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. So Jesus gave warning about false teachers, and Paul did too. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, he said, the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Well, part of the problem about listening to false prophets is they give you false hope. Jeremiah, once again, in chapter 23, verse 16, said it like this. He said, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. Earlier in chapter 6 of Jeremiah, verse 14, he said, They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. So false teachers, false prophets are, have gone out. Then you have the false prophet. We've seen this as we've gone through Revelation who comes out before the, uh, the Antichrist and, he, and he's doing false signs, false wonders, and, and he's compelling people to worship the Antichrist. And so for a while during the tribulation, there is a short-lived peace. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, it says, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So, the only way things will get any better is when the Lord returns. Now, we've been looking at this tribulation, and we've seen that the tribulation is a time of unprecedented sorrow and pain. It's a time unprecedented in human history. Antichrist will establish his rule. Demons infest the earth. God's wrath is poured out in sealed trumpet and bowl judgments. Evil permeates the entire earth. Christians are slaughtered. Well, again, Jesus made it clear that the time of tribulation would be horrific. In Matthew 24, 22, he said, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So as we arrive at this portion of Scripture, Antichrist's capital is devastated. People, when they see the devastation of commercial Babylon, begin to mourn and begin to wail. They're hardened, and they're unrepentant, even at the destruction of Babylon. As we've gone through the, the book of Revelation, we've seen that during the seven years that the raptured church has been in heaven awaiting its marriage. And before this celebration takes place, there's going to be a battle. The armies of heaven and hell will meet in what is called the final battle, the battle of Armageddon. And Jesus' enemies will be vanquished. And when this occurs, his kingdom will be established. He will rule and he will reign. Now, there's so much that's tied to his return. Satan and his false prophet will be imprisoned in the lake of fire. Jesus is crowned the true king. He begins to rule and reign with a rod of iron in Jerusalem. We'll see that in just a moment. But one of the things that we need to remember is this, is that the return of Christ is what believers have been waiting for. And here's something for you. One way to evaluate your relationship with Jesus Christ is simple. Do you want to see him? I've had people tell me this. It's kind of hard to believe sometimes, but it's true. I've had people say, well, you know, I do want the Lord to return, but I want to get married first. And I say, so you want to go through tribulation, huh? Really, you know, oh, I want to have children, so you want to go to hell. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> wow, it's getting worse. But here it is. One way to evaluate your relationship is do you desire to see him? Do you want to be with him? You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, 
And notice he says, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This desire to see him and to be with him. So today we have a preview of coming attractions. We have the return of Jesus Christ. Now, chapter 19, as I've already mentioned, and I'll give you a little background to remind you of this. Uh, chapter 19 picks up where chapter 16 concluded. It's at the conclusion of what are called the bowl judgments, the most serious of all the judgments. When we looked at verses 1 through 10, we saw heaven explode in praise to God because evil on earth has been judged. We saw how God judged Babylon. And his judgment has been declared to be true and righteous. And, and in doing so, he, he had avenged the blood of the martyrs who had been crying out for justice. In Revelation 6, verse 10, it says that they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, in bringing judgment, heaven rejoices and heaven worships him. And it's, it's a time of praise, and I pointed out that angels, Old Testament saints, tribulation saints are all praising God. And the reason why they're, they're doing so is because he reigns. We looked at what is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where the church, the bride of Christ, is joined to Jesus in its deepest intimacy. And now we move to what every believer is to long for, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, in verse 11, he said, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And so in chapter 4, we saw at verse 1 how John had said a door is standing open in heaven, and that's the door that basically, in a way, let John in. Well, this time, heaven has opened in order for Jesus to leave, to come out. It's, it's time for Jesus to be revealed for who he is. Now, when we look at the return of Christ to planet Earth. It's what is called an essential, for those who take notes. It's an essential of the Christian faith, an essential. It's one of those things that, that is very important for us to embrace and hold fast to in faith. You see, there are certain things that are actual beliefs that constitute what is called the basic Christian faith. We believe in biblical inerrancy, meaning that the original manuscripts are inspired and without error. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in what is called substitutionary atonement. Jesus died on the cross for us. We believe in a literal resurrection. These are essentials. But we also believe in Jesus returning. It's called the doctrine of the second coming. It's been said that in the 216 chapters of the New Testament, there are over 300 references to the return of Jesus Christ. 23 of the 27 New Testament books mention his return. The second coming is part of the earliest statements concerning the Christian faith. We had what is called the Apostles' Creed that to this day continues to be repeated. It's a statement of faith that was first mentioned around 390 A.D. Many of you know the Apostles' Creed, or perhaps you're familiar with it. I was taught the Apostles' Creed when I was eight years old. And, and you may remember it even as I recite it to you, actually read it to you to make sure it's word for word perfect. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic, the word Catholic means universal, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. It's part of the earliest creeds that we have. It's an essential to our faith. Jesus Christ is returning. And believers in all the ages have had a desire for the Lord to come. All the way back in the book of Isaiah in chapter 64, verses 1 and 2, we read, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies. Cause the nations to quake before you. You see, the church is to fully expect the return of Christ, and we're to live longing to see him. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 9, verse 28, said it like this. He said, so also Christ died only once, 
as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again, but not to deal with our sins again. This time he will bring salvation to all those who are eagerly waiting for him. So we've been taught to expect his return. We've been told, prepare yourself. In 1 John 3, 2 and 3, John said it like this. He said, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And he went on to say, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Well, during the tribulation, as we've seen, earth will be in incredible chaos and destruction. The Antichrist has been masquerading as Messiah. Under his rule and reign, the earth has undergone devastation. We've seen the plagues and the earthquakes, the death, the pollution, persecution. That's become the norm. Satan and demons, the Antichrist, a false prophet, sinful mankind are uniting to oppose God. And men are hearing the message because there are the witnesses who are sharing and they're hearing this message of reconciliation, but they refuse to repent. They harden their hearts and they fight against God and they fight against his gospel. Well, we'll see that the forces of heaven and hell are going to meet in a great battle, the battle of Armageddon. And it's at this time that Jesus' enemies are vanquished. His kingdom will be established. Zechariah chapter 14, again in the Old Testament, verses 3 and 4 says, The Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. And so what we're seeing here is the return of Jesus Christ. And notice again in verse 11 how it begins. It says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. So heaven is opened, and Jesus comes out and is bringing judgment on earth. In Matthew 24, verses 27 through 31, he said, As lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. And so John says, I saw heaven opened, letting Jesus out. And behold, he says, a white horse. He speaks of the white horse. Now think of that for a moment. And let me remind you of something that recently we observed. Remember that on Palm Sunday, how that on Palm Sunday, the Lord Jesus Christ entered into the city of Jerusalem. And on that day, he entered in on a donkey. In the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 15, it says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. You remember that? You remember the teaching? You remember that Jesus Christ was fulfilling what Zechariah in chapter 9 had prophesied concerning the, the king coming on this on the foal, the, the colt of a donkey. And you remember how he came in and they began to put out the palm branches as he entered in. And, and some were coming from the top, from uh, the top of the hill there. Others were coming out of the gates of Jerusalem and the two crowds converge. And as the two crowds were converging, they were dropping palm branches and, and dropping down uh, various objects before him. And they were crying out and they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, which the word Hosanna means saved now. And they said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And then Jesus had come, and as he, he waited for a moment, and he wept over Jerusalem and said, if you'd have known this day, but, but you didn't, 
And, and he speaks concerning the fact that they missed the moment when Messiah entered in. And it's a very dramatic time. But he came in on a donkey. Why did he come in on the donkey? Well, we know because when, when a king came in peace, the king would ride on a donkey. And so the first time Jesus entered in, he came on a donkey. But this time, he's on a war horse. The Bible says that he's on a white horse. And, and all we need to do is remember that victorious Roman generals would ride upon white horses in processions called triumphs or victory victory processions, and, and the victorious general would come in, and he would come in on a white horse. And so this is a picture of Jesus Christ coming as a conqueror. He's now seated on a war horse, not a donkey, but a war horse, and he's going to complete his victory. This is a white horse. Why is it a white horse? Well, because it represents the spotless, unblemished, holy character of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1.19, that verse tells us that we've been cleansed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So the horse that he's riding reveals that he's come to vanquish his enemies. And notice who is riding on that horse. It says, he, verse 11, who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Faithful and true, the perfect picture of our Messiah, He's the one who's always faithful to his promises. And he's the one who always speaks the truth. Obviously, that is in contrast to the lies of Antichrist and the false prophet. Notice again in verse 11, in righteousness, he judges and makes war. Because he's faithful and because he's true, his judgment must be and will be righteous. His words are true, so he must judge the unrighteous. In Acts chapter 10, verse 42, we read, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that He, Jesus, was, is the one who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. In Acts 17, verse 31, it says that He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom He has appointed. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. So, verse 11, in righteousness he judges, but as a king, he makes war. Now, in his earthly ministry, Jesus is revealed very often as compassionate and kind, because he is. When Matthew wanted to describe him, he spoke of him in this way. In Matthew 12, verse 20, he said, a bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. Jesus is described to us many times in the New Testament as compassionate and kind. When he spoke of himself, remember in, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he said of himself that he's gentle and lowly in heart. But here, he's revealed as the warrior king. In righteousness, he judges and he wages war. And his judgment has been poured out. His judgment has been poured out in the seal judgments, in the trumpet judgments, and in the bowl judgments. So we've seen that judgment comes, but now we see him waging war. When you read your Bible, there is an interesting song. It's called the Song of Moses. It's found in Exodus chapter 15, and it's a song that he composed after, after God had given them that miraculous deliverance by opening the sea and allowing them to proceed on dry ground and, and to be saved from Pharaoh and his armies. And, and so Moses uh, wrote what is called the, the uh, Song of Moses. And, and a couple of the verses of that song go like this. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My father's God. I will exalt him. Then he says this, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And this is what we're seeing here because notice verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. I want you to think of, of that for just a moment when it says his eyes. I don't know if you've ever taken the time when you read your Bibles, I don't know if you read and stop, meditate and consider what, it's taking place, but do it and, and think of it like this. When he says his eyes were a flame of fire, 
the eyes of Jesus Christ. Well, his eyes were filled with compassion. We know that. Why? Because Matthew tells us that he saw the people and he was compassionate towards them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So we know that Jesus, when he looked at the people, that there would have been a compassion that came out of his eyes. If you wave, he saw that he looked at them with compassion. There was a time when uh, there was a, a, a funeral procession. There was a woman who was unnamed. She's simply referred to as the widow of Nain, a small city there in, in, in Israel. And uh, she was uh, burying her, her son, her only son, we're told in Scripture. And, and Jesus looks at this, this widow and this procession. And there's no doubt in his heart that you could see the compassion of, of, the, of the man, Jesus Christ, to the point where he, he actually raised this widow's son from the dead. And there he is at the, at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. He had received word from, from Lazarus' sister that the one whom you love is, is nigh unto death. Hurry quickly. He's going to die. And we know the story of how that Jesus came. And, but he came days later. So when they saw him, they said, if you'd only been here on time. But he's been dead now for four days. And he said, where did you lay him? And they took him to the place where he had been laid. And, and, and he, says, he says, open up the tomb. And, and they said, Lord, he's been dead now for four days. He stinks. There's a smell of death. There's a smell of rot. Within four days, they begin to putrefy. He, he, he stinks. And the scripture gives us the shortest, the shortest verse in the New Testament. Jesus wept. So these are the eyes of compassion. These are the eyes that saw the, 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 the people without a shepherd. These are the ones, the eyes that saw the woman who who had lost her son. This is the one who wept. And the times, his eyes are filled with tears as he saw the place where they buried his friend. And these are the same eyes, by the way, that when Jesus was being mistreated and beaten in the night that he had been betrayed and the apostle Peter had been there warming himself at the enemy's fire and, and Jesus had been going through severe beating and and pain, and, and they began to lead him out. And, and the Bible tells us very clearly that, that, that Peter turned and saw Jesus, and their eyes met. These were the eyes of the one who forgave someone like the apostle who had denied him. So when you read your Bible, consider that for a moment. Consider the times that he saw so much, and, and consider how he how he would look, how he would see the children and, and the eyes that Christ would have with the babies when, when the mamas would bring their babies to Jesus and they'd say, can you, can you bless them? And, and when Jesus would see the hurt and when, when that, that man was lowered from, from the roof and, and placed in, in front of his feet and he's just looking at him and the man who's, who's, who can't walk, his friends had lowered him through that broken roof you know, that man can't move and he's looking at Christ. You can imagine how he's looking at Jesus, but you can also imagine how Jesus was looking at him. Your sins are forgiven. This is the one, when you read your Bible, so very often would look upon the crowd, the, the one who would have compassion, would describe himself as being gentle and humble. But now the Bible says his eyes are like a flame of fire. That's the difference now. His eyes are flashing, if you will, with the flame of judgment. These eyes are searching, they're exposing, they're observing, and they're penetrating. And he sees everything clearly, by the way. His judgment is not clouded. In Hebrews 4.13, it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And so Jesus has eyes that are a flame of fire. And verse 12 says, And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew. So the many crowns simply reveals that he is the king of the whole earth. He's the king of kings. Remember again on earth, they crowned him. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. But now he wears the crown of the king. 
Now, when it says in verse 12, and this is interesting, and I'll touch it for just a moment, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. Let me tell you that name. No, I don't know it. <laughs> Nobody does. The way I read the Bible is if it doesn't tell me, then I don't speculate. So we don't know. We simply know that it's a name that is known only to himself. But he continues in verse 13, and he says, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This blood, he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood. This blood is not the blood that he, he poured out on the cross when he bought us, when he purchased our redemption. The blood that we see here is a picture of judgment. See, the blood that we see is a picture of the blood of his enemies that he has slain. Isaiah 63, verses 2 and 3, Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. So this is a blood of the enemies that are slain. And some wonder, well, wait a minute. Why has his garments been splattered with blood? He hasn't gone into the final battle. Why is there blood on his robe? And this is something that ought to encourage every believer. The answer is that he has fought for his people throughout our history. This isn't his first battle. It's a picture of his final battle. Now notice his name, verse 13, is called the Word of God. When it says his name is called the Word of God, this is what you call one of the titles of Messiah. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. When you get to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And so Jesus' title is the word of God. This is one of his titles. And that's why it says his name is called the word of God. He's the word of God. He is a visible representation of the invisible God. In Colossians 1.19, Paul said, It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Speaking of Christ, in Colossians 2 verse 9, in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so he is the word of God. In verse 14, it continues and said, The armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's interesting. I can't ride a horse. I'm going to have to learn pretty quickly. The raptured saints, we are included in what are called the armies of heaven. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, Paul said, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. These armies of heaven, let me look at them for a moment with you. The armies of heaven are Old Testament saints. They are the raptured saints. They are the bride that we see, uh, the tribulation saints. Angels. So those consist of what is referred to as the armies of heaven. Now, Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, said it like this. He said, God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us. When the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. You see, when the sixth bowl judgment was poured out, the armies of Antichrist and armies began to gather. The kings of the east, as we saw in Revelation 16, have assembled. They're joined by Antichrist, seven remaining kings, according to Daniel chapter 7. During this time, Babylon is destroyed. Antichrist moves against Jerusalem. The armies are now gathering for an assault. Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 3 says, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up. The rulers band together against the Lord, against his anointed, 
saying, let us break their chains, let us throw off their shackles. And so all of this is occurring, and Jesus responds. Notice verse 15, it says, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And so Jesus responds, the sword that comes out of his mouth reveals his power, the power of his word. He's doing what he said he would do. He's bringing judgment. He had warned them. That's the whole thing. In the preaching of the gospel, there's a continuous warning for the things that are to come. And that when the gospel is preached and when we speak concerning the return of Christ and things related to that, there's always a warning when the gospel is proclaimed and people who don't know Jesus hear it, they're being, they're being warned, they're being told, these are the things that are going to happen. You need to come to faith in Christ. You need to turn away from your wicked ways. When my father and mom were not saved, I got saved and I was there in the, in the kitchen. That was what motivated me. That's what I was taught. I was taught if, if, if you don't know Christ, you go to hell. There is a place called hell. You are going to go there. And I believed it then. I believe it now. And my mom and my dad, that's why I shared with them. And that's why I told my dad what I told him. You're a good man, dad. Best man I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Christ. I love you, daddy. And I don't want to go to heaven without you. That's what motivated me. Because that's the warning. And I was taught that from the earliest age of Christianity, from the time I got saved at 20. You need to be right with God. You need to give your heart to Christ. You can't be playing with God. And if you tell him you're going to follow him, it needs to be sincere and real. It can't be one of the things that you say to a friend just to get over on them or a girl just to get with her. It's got to be the truth. It's got to be something you mean with all sincerity. And that's why I held back for so long when I heard the gospel. I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. But the day I gave my heart to Christ, it was forever. It wasn't just for this moment or this week or this month. It's been for the last 50 years and it goes into eternity because that's what you do when you respond to Christ. That's how it works. And so the sword reveals the power of Christ, what he has said he will do, and he comes and he kills the wicked. The rest of the world, the unredeemed that survived this because he kills those in Armageddon, but there are others who are surviving that aren't this particular location. Well, ultimately what happens is there's what is called the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Jesus mentioned that, taught us that in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Well, this judgment that we're looking at here is going to be swift. But it's also a model of how he's going to rule. Notice again in verse 15, he himself will rule with, it says, a rod of iron. A rod of iron is a picture of absolute authority. Men are required to serve him, to conform to his law. And they will face immediate penalty if they don't. He's going to judge all sin. He's going to bring swift judgment on those who disregard him. In Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, Only ask, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. Notice how in verse 15, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his, verse 16, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has the absolute right to rule because he has absolutely triumphed over his enemies. Well, as this is taking place, verse 17, I, I saw an angel standing in the sun. He cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. What, an, what a picture. I don't even like to think of that. I really don't. I, I mean, wh what a picture. Remember in the, the fifth bowl judgment, how that the sun at that time had been darkened? You saw that in chapter 16. 
Well, it would seem that darkness has ended. The sun is now shining, but the angel is standing in the light of the sun, but he's even more brilliant than the sun. And again, instead of what we had seen last time, the supper of the lamb, well, the birds eat the flesh of the conquered. And this invitation is given before Jesus actually comes in judgment. We'll see that in a moment. The dead bodies will be strewn over the 200-mile length of the battlegrounds there. When you think of Armageddon, there, Armageddon is an, an area, it's, it's in Megiddo, but the, 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 uh, the, the area is not just a small area. It actually goes uh, a great distance. And so it, this, this dead bodies are going to be strewn. According to Revelation 14, 20, the wine press was trampled outside the city. Blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. That's 200 miles. And so this is taking place here. An invitation is given because a slaughter is occurring. And he says in verse 19, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And so there's a gathering, a rebellion, a desire to battle. The beast, his, his ten kings, the armies, they've gathered to fight against the Lord. They gather together awaiting the rider of the white horse. And then what happens? Is there a great big fight? No. Verse 20, the beast was captured with him, the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. You know, there was a time when, when as a young believer, um, there were people who were, who, were, who were saying, well, that there is a God, and then there's the God of light, and then there's the God of darkness. And there are different religious systems that actually teach that. Zoroastrianism is one that speaks of the, uh, uh, the God of light, the God of darkness. And they're basically co-equal, if you will. And there were those who were believing that, 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 that Satan and that God Almighty are equal. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. There's never been a point in the Scripture that you'll ever see that, that God says, oh, no, what am I going to do? Satan showed up. You, you never see that. You, you never see that. You know, it's because it's, it's not true. You know, the, I want you to see this because it doesn't talk about a big old war. As a matter of fact, what you might find interesting is this. We don't even fight. We, the armies of heaven, we're just there watching our king just demolish these monsters. We just go, yeah, Lord, way to go. Thank you, Jesus. We don't even fight. You can stand there swinging around if you want. That's okay. You ain't going to do any good. No, it's the Lord. He does it with the sword of his mouth. In other words, and I don't want to say this in a way that, that, that is um, improper, but all this time, so many people have been afraid of Satan. He has no power over you. He, he does not. He does not. If God is for us, Paul said, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody. Oh, I could tell you stories about that one, but I'll just say it like this. The Lord taught me a long time ago, I don't have to be the baddest guy in the room. I just need to be friends with the one who is. <laughs> That's the truth. When I was in the world, I didn't have to be a fighter. I just had to know the, know the guy who could. <laughs> He's picking on me. All right, I'll take him out. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, I have a friend who is the baddest one in the universe. I don't know how else to say it. I'll say it like that. The baddest one in the universe. And guess what? He's my brother. He's Jesus. And so Jesus, yes, when Jesus, I'll give you a story, one story, one story. <laughs> story time. I was six years old. Yes, I was at one time six. And I went to school in Montebello in a school called Fremont Elementary. I say that because sometimes people from Montebello say, I went to that school. And I'll say, yeah, I remember you. No, I, <laughs> and you know, I went there for a little while. And I was, I didn't have any friends. So I was walking on the playground. 
I have a brother who's a couple years older than me. I was walking on the playground one, one day, and some kids were playing kickball, and the ball rolled to me, and they said, hey, give us the ball, you know, and they said it in a way that I didn't like. So I picked up, and I kicked it in the opposite direction. Go get it yourself. Well, they didn't like it. And so a guy jumped on me, a little older than me. I still remember his angry face as he was trying to strangle me. And I was kind of laughing. You're like, this is kind of weird. Why are you doing this? It's just a ball. Go get it. But this angry face, true story, this angry face that he was showing to me, he was really mad for some reason, um, changed to one of pain. I, I, he's, he's close to me. And so I'm looking at him, and his face from this... And, well, I looked over my, his shoulder, and my older brother, Frankie, was behind him and had grabbed him by the neck with his thumb and his forefinger and was squeezing it, and the kid was doing this, and my brother pulled him off. See, I've never forgotten that. So Jesus, that's Jesus. He does it for me. That's why, that's why you don't have to fear. I mean, my pastor taught us something a long time ago. He said, when you see Jesus is afraid, then maybe you should be. But if you never see him afraid, then maybe you don't need to be. Just makes sense to me. What's he afraid of? He's not afraid of anything. He's not afraid of anything. This is not even a fight. It's just he comes down, boo, it's over. That's, that's what happens. It's done. The beast was captured with him, the false prophet who works signs in his presence. These people who are looked at as so fierce and so awesome and to be worshipped, immediately they're dealt with. And it says... They were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And so the first, they are the first ones to enter into what has been called the permanent place of eternal incarceration. They're cast into that. Next week we get to see a, see a second phase of this. But it goes on to say in verse 21, And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The armies exterminated. There will be judgment, as mentioned, the sheep and goat judgment. And those who rejected mercy received judgment. I've had more than one conversation with people who said, well, I'll hear you another time, maybe some other time. I'm not ready right now. When I was first witnessed to, when people would first share with me about the gospel, I was I was a young, you know, a younger teen, and I, I remember the first time somebody spoke to me about Jesus Christ, and I was on the beach, and you know, enjoying the sun and and um, uh, the girls in their bikinis and everything else, right? And, and I'm thinking, now he said, you know, you need Jesus Christ. This guy, I still remember him. He's standing with his Bible, some young guy, and he's looking at me, and I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I was 16. Are you kidding me? I said, not. I'm not. not look around you. You think I want to not enjoy what's in front of me? I want to have as many girls as I can. I want to have, I want to drink as much as I want. I want to do as much dope as I, as I can. Are you kidding me? But I, I remember saying, you know, I think what you're saying is true. And I, I did intellectually. I think what you're saying is true. There is a God and, and there is a, a Messiah, Jesus. I had been taught that. And yes, you know, there is a heaven. I didn't know too much about hell. I didn't, I don't know if I even really thought of that. But I said, yeah, there is a heaven. Yes, I want to go to heaven. Uh, those are all things. But I remember saying, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I've got things to do. I've got things to do. I've got more misery to go through. <laughs> I've got more misery to go through. More pain, more sorrow, more heartache, more evil. I can't tell you what took place between the time I was 16, first hearing the gospel, and 20 when I got saved. But if I'd have, if I'd have known that I'd be in jail with a friend vomiting in my face and the cops laughing, look at this, look at this. And my friend Bill, who became a police officer and still teases me about this, but when Bill was there puking on me and I was saying, stop it, Bill, and he was saying, I can't. <laughs> Man, they ought to do that for one of the beer commercials. Hey, guys, drink this and look what can happen. <laughs> yeah, right? You know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you pretend you don't know, but you know. <laughs> Is there anything you wish you would have avoided before coming to Christ? Anything? 
but they harden their hearts. When you reject mercy, you receive judgment. I used to try to teach that. I'll close with this. I used to try to teach that to my kids, and I told my David when he was a young kid, I said, son, you did something that you ought to really get a spanking for. But I'm going to teach you something. It's the word grace, son. It means unmerited favor. And though I should spank you for what you did, I'm going to give you grace. Learn this lesson, my son. Thank you, Daddy. Fine. A week or two later, he did something wrong. And I said, oh, son. And he said, Dad, grace, grace, Daddy, grace. And I said, nope, judgment. Wham! You know, <laughs> when, you re when you reject grace, you only have judgment. Never forget that. You reject mercy, you leave yourself for judgment. They did not want God's grace and mercy, and they ended up with his judgment. So scripture teaches us, and I'll close with this scripture, to live a life separated to the Lord and to live with expectation. In Titus chapter 2, 13, we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We wait for that blessed hope. We wait to see the one who is our hope, and we prepare ourselves. And that moment when we'll see him is not that far away. Don't convince yourself that it's a long distance away. I promise you, you will discover should the Lord give you strength to live many years, you're going to discover how quickly your life has passed by. And for those of you who are parents of adult children, you know what I'm saying. You once had a small baby, and now that baby's married, giving you small babies. And it's like you blinked your eye. How did this happen? How did they get so old and I stayed so young? How did that happen? <laughs> And then, and then you can see whether God answers all prayers because I prayed, may you have a child as bad as you were to me. <laughs> Father, we bless you and we thank you, Lord, for indeed we do look forward to being with our King Jesus, who is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the one who loves us and who gave himself for us. And he's returning. He came as Messiah. But the next time he comes as judge. So I ask that we might. Never take that for granted. And I ask that you would just work in our hearts. Lord, we've heard the message. We know that we're sinners. We know we need your grace and forgiveness. We know the blood of Christ. Your son cleanses us from all sin. I ask that we have applied that. I pray that every person watching this in here has applied that blood, has by faith received that washing. Know you. And even as our eyes clo are closed for a moment, perhaps there are some right now who need to get right with the Lord. You need to give your heart to Christ. You may be watching online. You may be in an overflow. You may be in this room. But if you know you need prayer and you need to get right with the Lord, before I close, I want to pray for you that you might open your heart and be with him. And so if you know that you need him right now, you need to be right, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at? Just raise your hand so I might see you. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would reach down and touch these whose hands are raised. And Father, that you would just touch them in such a way that their lives forever will be changed. May your Holy Spirit work in them deeply, washing, cleansing, and empowering that they might live for you. From this moment on, Lord, I pray that they would know you, hunger for you, and follow you. Work in them, Lord. Transform them and be glorified in them. So as our, our hands are raised to you, we pray that you would reach down and touch. And we give you thanks for this now, Lord, and bless you. Thank you. We receive it. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, I ask that you keep moving in all of us to your glory, in your name. Amen.